This program is brought to you by Guiding Light Assembly. I've been thinking a lot about opportunities, seizing opportunities, but seizing them in a manner and in a way that is aligned with the heart of God. One thing that we tend to do as Christians sometimes is we try to build our own miracle and manifest things for ourselves. And there's a scripture that God showed me. I'm pretty sure many of you here will know it, but I'll just read Matthew 6 from verse. I'll read verse 1 to 4, but the focal point will be verse 1 and 2. It says, if you can open it yourselves as well, so that your eyes can see it and that you can highlight it and not forget it. Is right. It says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. God bless the reading of his word. Amen. I am almost consistently and continually praying um, about service and what it means to serve. Because I've kind of come to the realization a lot of the times what we do with our service it's funny, okay, so I'll just, I'll put it this way. So, when people serve in church, what do they call them? What do we call people who serve in church? Okay. It's literally not. <laughs> you call them that too. But, okay, if you're looking for somebody to serve in church, what do you say you're looking for? Yeah, volunteers. Thank you. Got there in the end. But it's almost really hard to call people volunteers in church anymore. There's a lot of people volunteer in church, but while they're volunteering, they're like, what am I getting? I really brought to mind what it is when it comes to this heart of worship, because so many people like volunteer, and I know, trust me, I know, I'm aware that times and situations and circumstances are hard. I am well abreast of that information. I was literally thinking about it the other day. I think when I moved back to Nigeria, $500 was 180K. Now $500 is about 660K. And so I realized that circumstances are different. While situations and circumstances change, God does not change. When I read this scripture, it's talking about doing charitable deeds, which I guess sometimes volunteering can be considered a charitable deed. The question is, if you are doing it and saying, what am I getting? What happens is not that you can't get something, you can get something. But the Bible says that, <laughs> well, you already said that bargain. You have received your reward, therefore don't look and wait for another reward. I have a lot of people who are like, I do this, I serve, I give, I, I do all of these things. But God, what are you doing for me? We don't realize we've entered sometimes a negotiation with God. I've already reaped all we asked for. And the problem that, with that, right, is it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing. Like I said, there's situations and circumstances and I understand the nature of the nation. But what you can ask for from God can never compare to what he can give because your eyes have not seen. 
your ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God will do for those who diligently serve him. And so because you haven't you haven't you don't have a framework by which to ask for God, whatever you ask of God will be less than he can give. And you've entered that negotiation, collected that reward, and been content. What's the story in the Bible is just coming to me? Where um, the, Jesus, I think Jesus is telling a parable, and you know, a worker, a man goes, a, a guy who was a man, and like this literally just comes to my head, so I can't even tell you where it is or any of that. But the guy goes to to the master. The master is negotiating with people, so people, okay, people are going to work for him for let's say it's a week, and he negotiates this amount. And then he needs more workers maybe a couple of days later. So someone else is going to work for him for five days and then he negotiates an amount. And then someone else is going to work for him for three days and then someone else is going to work for him for only one and he negotiates an amount. Now, when the person, when the people are getting paid and the guy who worked for seven days finds out that the guy who worked for one day is getting paid the same amount as him and he's offended and he's upset. The reason that we get upset in those situations is one, we're building our negotiation, we're, we're now questioning what we got comparatively to others. When he was negotiating, he was content with his negotiation because he thought that was enough. It was only with hindsight that he realized that he could get a higher value. But because he was limited when he went to the throne to ask the master, he received only what he asked for. And so many of us have done that. You know, we serve and times are hard. And so, you know, I'll get what I can ask for. I'll serve. But if I'm going to come, I need transport. It's not a problem. Some people literally can't get there. They don't ask for transport. I understand. Once you enter that negotiation, that transport became the value of your service. You did not leave it to God to apportion out he would bless you with. Because you do not understand what you could ask for. And it's why, you know, I love this, the scripture that talks about when we do not have words, the spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings which cannot be understood by man. It's because you said, God, I recognize I have a need. I don't have language or understanding for my need. You have language and understanding for my need. So supply me. And what I will do is I will enter this negotiation not with my understanding, but by your understanding. And I will let you, who the Bible has already told us, is our intercessor that Jesus consistently stands before the judgment seat of the Father and makes intercessions on our behalf. And I will let your intercession speak for me because I realize that there is greater value and that what I desire in my heart is limited. It's like how you tell people that if you teach a man, if you give a man fish, he will eat for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he will have capacity to eat for a lifetime. But when we are in our problem, we do not see with that level, with that perspective. So when we go to God, when we go, we ask questions, our level of desperation blinds us to how much is available. And then we only ask for breadcrumbs. It's like uh, the prodigal son goes and says, I want my inheritance. Goes, he takes his inheritance, he spends it all. And when he comes back and the father tells him to kill the fattened calf and they kill it and he's celebrated and there's an abundance of food. His brother, who has lived there his entire life and never went away, never did what his what his brother did but his eyes were also never opened 
to his potential in Christ. And so he gets upset that his father is doing this for his brother and not doing it for him. And when his father comes to speak to him and tells him that everything I have is yours. If you wanted them to kill the fattened calf, you could have simply told them. But his mentality and his lack of vision cause him to live the vast majority of his life with less than he had access to because he did not know. When God chose, I believe it's John, right? We largely believe it's John that wrote the book of Revelation. When God reveals to him what he does in Revelations 4, and the 24 elders fall on their face and they cast their crowns, what they're doing is they're giving God authority over all they have and all their life. If the thing that has given you any access or power in life, you lay before God, you're telling him, I want you to make my decisions. I want you to bless me how you see fit to bless me. I want you to open doors where you see fit to open doors. I want you to close doors when you see fit to close doors. And we are saying, they're saying, whatever decision you make, I am content with that decision because I trust your decision making. One of the problems that we have as humans is that we say we trust God's decision making, but we'd rather he made, our, he made the decisions we want him to make. What have you done with the authority in your life? When you serve God, are you serving God because your heart yields to serve Him? Or are you serving Him because, let's be honest, you're not sure. Like I, I heard, I was having a conversation with someone, they were talking about how, like, the thing that keeps them from a life of crime. Is it just that kind of person that won't get away with it? <laughs> so if they did it, they're the ones that will end up in Kirikiri. And so what that means is that your posture is not, I'm not sinning because I know that sinning is wrong. I'm not sinning because I don't think I can get away with it. Or I'm serving God because I don't see the option that I can manifest for myself that would give me what I want. But if I knew that I could do it another way and get away with it, maybe I would. And so what that means is that God has become a strategy or the road of least resistance to living an amenable life. It means that it's not even about God. So in people who, so like the, when after, in I think it's the book of Acts, and after the Spirit of God has come down, I think it's Paul, it's Paul or it's Peter, I can't remember, but I think it's Paul, um, who they see working miracles and, and, and casting out demons and then this uh, magician comes and he's like, teach me how to cast out demons like you do. And he's ready to pay. It means that he's seen something that washes his eyes and he's ready to enter a transaction to gain that kind of power. But his desire is not actually God. Too many people use God as a transactional way to obtain a certain quality of life. Your perspective is not even eternal. But when we get to a place where our perspective in life is eternal, where the desire of our heart is the will of God and God alone, I've talked about this here before, where we're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you don't even need to read the next half of the verse 
and care or wonder about whether you have all the things that follow. Paul said, I have learned with how to abase and abound. He became a person whose life he did not, he wasn't moved whether he was in a season of lack or in a season of plenty. His primary focus was being connected to God. I don't know how many of us can truly turn ourselves, look at the Father and say, my primary focus in this life is you and you alone. Is what you have for me, it is what you are doing in my life. I don't know how many people wouldn't be shaken or moved if the things you dream for, if God told you today, you know a lot of us we move <laughs> we move by faith right so we're desiring but so you, you're going through the process and while things aren't good now there's this hope that what God has said will come to pass and so that motivates you it stirs you up to keep going I was reading about I was just thinking about like Isaiah and your Jeremiah's the other day and I was thinking man the word God gave them was hard because God didn't, like God was very open with Isaiah. He said that he has put his words in the mouth and he told him that many of the people who spoke to will not give their lives. And even the ones who would eventually give their life, it is a hard thing to do to go out and speak as you've been told, as you've been led, as the Spirit of God is telling you and see zero change. See zero change. In fact, see people sinning worse. See people committing more and more atrocities. See more people falling away. See more people worshipping idols and still stand and say what God told you to say. It takes a lot to move with God and see nothing shifting or changing in the circumstances. If anything, things getting worse as opposed to getting better. And then they'd be galvanized with a hope that there will still be, as how God told you to Isaiah, there'll be a remnant. There'll still be a remnant. And when like when 90% of the people you are speaking to have fallen aside, there'll still be that 10% who will hear. That's like me preaching here and two people being changed. But two people don't even get changed this Sunday. They don't get changed next Sunday. They don't get changed. They don't get changed a year. They don't get changed in five years. They get, their lives get changed and things shift in 10 years. What motivates you to keep going? If God said. And so... I was thinking about like, what's your, what's your real focus? If God told you today, then that thing you desire more than anything, do you believe God has promised you? If He told you today, it will never happen. You will never see it. Will you still serve? If He told you, you will never get married. If He told you, you will never have children. He told you you'll never have wealth. It wasn't a question of, I know God is good and God will do it for me. If you know that the entire of your life on this side of eternity, you will never see the things you hope for, what will you do? Because it's very fun to live the, read the first part of Hebrews 11 when it's talking about the people of faith who saw what God had promised them. But then in the second half of Hebrews 11, when it's talking about those who never saw it on this side of eternity, will your love for God remain the same? If he told you, you will never see the manifestation of these things in your life. What will the posture of your heart be? Will it still be about God? Will it still be? Because you know, this is when you now start to check whether when you're singing songs, your heart is singing them or your mouth is singing them. 
Because when you're quoting scripture, you're saying that, you know, yeah, he slay me. So will I trust him. Can you say that with your chest? Can your heart say it? If everything gets plucked away from you. Look at Job. Everything, everyone, every ounce of value in his life plucked away. The problem now when we read that scripture is that we read it with hindsight and so we don't think of the depth of how it felt because we know that God gave him the double portion of everything he had before. But God doubled his wealth, doubled his family, doubled his home. And because of that perspective, we don't consider how that really would have felt for Job sitting in the middle with his wife gone, his children gone, his livestock gone. Everyone, the people who are still around criticizing him and looking down on him and looking around you and literally having nowhere and no one to turn to. And being told, God has abandoned you because you're a sinner. In that, would you still love the Lord? I know that every single one in here has their challenges and trials. I've seen my moments and been tried and tested and I know that God gives everyone their trials and their testings. I know you've seen pain, I know you've felt pain, I know you've been hurt. But truly and surely, how many times have you let your circumstance discourage you? I come to church, but I can't praise. Or I can't even come to church. But you know what? It's it's painful and tiring to be circumstance, your situation get you so deflated that you'd rather just sink in to your bed and watch Netflix for hours and hours and not have to think about anything. I wish it just went numb. on your heart when it comes to service when it comes to laying things before the Lord have you laid them before God because you trust him with them or is it merely a symbol so that God will give you all the things you really want the Bible says the treasure is your heart is also you look at yourself, you look at your circumstance, where is your treasure? Where do you find value? God told you, you're pushing and you're praying and you're fighting. That singing career you want will never happen. What would your heart posture be? I have to ask myself consistently. If this is it, if I'll never speak more to more than 20 people, 30 people, if I will, like is it, am I content with where God wants me? Or have I built a little idol for myself that this is what success looks like? And if I don't attain this, I'll never really be happy. We have to ask ourselves these questions. The Bible literally says, the heart of man is desperately wicked. And when I think about how wicked the heart is, it's not that, it's not just, yes, there, there's the terrible nature of the heart when you look at and things that happen in the world, you see people killing children, you see all sorts of things, you see rapists and all those kind of things. There's that. But God means deeper than that. It's that the heart is so wicked, not that, oh, you'll do something wicked to someone, that the heart does not just deceive or aim to deceive other people. 
that your own heart deceives you as to the intention. It's where things like pride come from. Where you start to think, oh, I'm better than somebody because I do this. Do they know that I gave 10 million naira an offering? I don't, amen, that day is coming. But, like, when you are tested by, by those kind of things, and you're like, well, may I give 10 million, may I able to do this? If I, and you think because of that, you built for yourself. And your heart has deceived you that your act was righteous when that act was full of pride and sin. And so when people are talking, it's like someone can even preach it right. This can't be me. There's no way this is me. I know myself. I know my love for God. And the heart is so deceptive. It's why God tells you to drive yourself, drive into the word. Because it's only by an encounter with the word that you can truly see the nature of your soul and of your heart for God to change it. One of the worst mistakes we make is when we go and we think, that oh, one is not for me. And it's cool, oh, you might be listening today and the word is not for you today. But best know to hide that word. Because the day will come. That's why the devil, when, when Job, Job was living his life for oh, being a good boy. The devil was came and said, I'm just walking up and down, looking for whom I might devour. And it just looks like it's okay, I'm fine, I don't need it. And you don't realize, I remember Pastor Shola Folaladeh was talking once, he was talking about how he had been counseling someone and the people they just, you know, this couple they were just getting divorced. And he was looking, the person was a pastor and he was like, I, I, I don't know how this, this person ever get divorced. I don't understand. It can never be me. He said that night, he was sleeping, so the spirit of divorce came into his room. And he was like, what is this one doing here? He said, right, you are the one that invited me because your pride deceived you. That when it comes to certain, there are certain things in this life here, when it comes, when I hear stories, when I see people, my my goal, my consistent place here, even if a thought flashes through my mind there, it's just God. Don't let it flow from my lips because this thing, this thing about life, there's some things that we look at, we hear people, we say it can never ever be us. There are people that are in jail for murder, they said it could never be me. Or all, oh, yeah, there's a saying when it comes to everybody is a murderer, all you need is the right circumstance and the right person upset you there are things in like there are things this truth about this human vessel this earthly vessel the devil did not start today it's like when children are growing up and it's like I don't even know what happens they turn 16 or something and all of a sudden they're looking at their parents like what does this person know why are you talking to me I'm an adult And it's, that's how we're fooled in life. They're like, we've been living, we're in our 30s now, 20s, whatever we are. And then we think, I know it all, I've had the experience. Why am I not there yet? The devil has been at this thing for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You are a baby and unless you are humble enough to know the only person that has superior wisdom understanding capacity strategy to navigate the things in this life is God it will shock you when you end up in the position of the people you looked at and judged God forbid it but the only thing that can keep us from that place is the humility to trust God and God alone. A 
is too easy to fall into sin. We are all here. Everybody, everybody in this room has their own table. Sin is too easy to fall into. One of the biggest problems of pride in the church is that because your sin is in private, you think you are okay to judge others. You think your sin isn't that bad. Recognize that it eats your life sometimes, I understand. But if I can put my clothes on and hide it, I can still carry myself like an elder. God, help us to not be deceived by our own hearts. To walk in alignment with you and your will. To not try and strategize our own way and build our own kingdom. We are merely vessels for your kingdom in the earth. Help us to remain humble. And teach us, show us the areas in our lives where there is pride. That our hearts not remain hard in that area. Help us to be shaped by your word and by your will and to value you above all things. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This program is brought to you by Guiding Light Assembly. 